Well, good morning. How are you this wonderful Sabbath? Very good, thank you. Good. So let's, um, let's get together, have a, a word of prayer, and, um, and we open our Bibles and start this wonderful lesson that for many, at least a portion of it, is a little bit confusing. Requires some math and perhaps some history. And unfortunately, I, I, I'm not good for neither one. But let's, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come this morning to study your word and to worship you. And we ask you, Lord, that you can be in this place, that we can um, have a full understanding of your message, and mostly that this study can get us close to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So we have this lesson, which is little by little taking us to, through, through the highway of prophecy. Yes. Thank you. The little by little is taking us to the highway of prophecy. And the prophecy of Revelation is attached, completely attached, to the prophecy of Daniel. The understanding of e that one is also the uh, resolution for the other one. It's a complement of each other. Also, another thing that we need to keep in mind, especially with this week's study, is the, uh, the study of the sanctuary, sanctuary. If we have a better understanding of the sanctuary, we're going to be able to understand what is actually happening toward the end of the lesson.
I feel very important having this mic change all the time. It says that we need to have a close connection with God. We are not safe. We are not safe a moment. A moment. A second. Unless guided and, control, and controlled by the Holy Spirit. And this is a question that I am... Um, I, I really hope that nobody will answer. Are you guided by the Holy Spirit every moment? This is for your thought only. It's only for your mind, for your soul. Are you connect? Are you connected with God? Are you awake? That God is ready, 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 protecting you. And in, in, in the book, Minister Healing says this: the omnipotent power of the Holy Spirit is the defense of every contrite soul. No one who is penitent and faith has claimed his protection will. Will Christ permit to pass under the enemy power? Again, because I know I messed up. No one who is in penitence and faith has claimed his protection. Will Christ permit to pass under the enemy's power? He says that God will not allow anybody that has connection with him to go through the enemy's power. We must claim that. We must claim that every single moment. Some of us, some of us like temptation. Let's be honest. Some of us like, oh, yeah, well, mm -hmm. some of us like the temptation that said, oh, you know, that, that feels good. That tastes good. That I like this. I'm going to let my, my mind to go there, but I'm not going to do it moment physically. I'm not going to actually do it myself. Those moments is the moments that Satan uses to rob us. You know, I have, I have mentioned this before. I have a big problem with, in a relationship with chocolate. Mm. I, I, um, I tried, this is, this is not because I feel better than anybody else, but I tried because of my own health. I tried not to eat, I don't need milk unless it's in chocolate. Are those two things in combination? A lot of times they come in combination. You know, sometimes, it, and there are moments in time that I am like, a, hmm, I don't care that piece of chocolate with nuts has a little bit of milk. I'd rather live with the consequences. I love it. I have mentioned this before, but you know, there are days, and, and I had almost every single day of this week, there are days that I get a chocolate about two in the afternoon. Actually, the staff that I work with sometimes comes, comes to my desk and leave me a chocolate and they walk away. And I know that I have that piece of chocolate and for those moments, after I have that chocolate, I know that I will be okay by the end of the day. This is the bad relationship that I have with chocolate. So sometimes I have chocolate on my desk. I'm living in that temptation. And I don't care if it has milk. I'm just going to keep over there. Maybe at 2 p.m. I'm going to get one. No, yeah, by 10 in the morning, I'll have my first one. So that we like to live in, in, this, in this risky life. And of course, the chocolate situation may be a simple thing for, for most of us. But this is how we deal with sin, with our relationship with God. I'll be okay. I'm just going to have the piece of chocolate right there just in case nobody brings me one. But as soon as I can, I will grab it. I'm going to repeat that. Repeat that the Lord will, will protect us, will not allow, will not permit to pass under the enemy, enemy's power when we concentrate with him, regardless of what your loved sin might be. Now, the... 
the cleansing of the sanctuary. So what is, what is the cleanse? Why, why does the sanctuary need to be clean? So here's, here's a puns that sometimes you get. It says, if, if after taking a shower, you dry with a clean towel, why would the, the towel get dirty? No. Why does the centurion need to be clean? Does it doesn't have a good housekeeper? So I can recommend a couple people. Why does the centurion need to be cleansed? Okay, let's talk about the sand dryer here for a sec, really quickly. So when, when the, when the um, sinner in the time of Israel all the, way through, all the way through Jesus, what we as the sinners used to do is we take, and according to Moses in the book of, of the, uh, Numbers and Deuteronomy, that you should take a, a little sheep, about a one-year-old, perfect, can I be a broken leg? Can I be anything? It has to be perfect. One year old. And then you took it to the sanctuary. And then right there in front of the sanctuary, or the entrance of the sanctuary, you grab this little sheep, sorry, um, lamb. You grab it over there and you pray silently and you pretty much confess your sin. Symbolically, what this was doing was to transfer in your sins to the lamb. And then after you got the lamb, after you finished your prayer, you took a knife and you cut and, and, and killed the lamb. From there, you called the priest. The priest got some of the blood and, and got the, the body of the lamb and went to do their process. The sinner left, done. But then one of the things the priest used to do is take that, that uh, um, blood and go and then put him in certain places, but mostly went to the holy place inside now the tent. The tent has two sections. The holy place where you have the 12 pieces of bread is a symbolism of the bread of life, one per tribe. Then on the other side, you have the, 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 the lamp, forgot the name, with the seven lights. And then in the middle, you have the incense, tabernacle of the incense, incense, representing the prayers that goes up to God. And then right behind that, there was a huge curtain the curtain has the symbols of three angels. Interesting. We, we learned at the beginning of this lesson about the message of the three angels. It had three angels over there. That curtain was not thin. It was very thick and heavy. And then symbolically, actually no, literally, uh, the priest took a little bit of that blood and spread it through the, the curtain through the most holy place. Just spray it. Didn't go inside and spray it. So it is important for us to understand that. Why? Because once a year, once a year, that was the day of atonement. That was the day that the most holy place was going to be clean of all the sins that through the year the priest was put in through the curtain. So the high, the high priest wore this specific clothing for that day. And, and granted, one thing that is important is that the high priest only can do that one time in his lifetime. So this is not something, well, hey, well, I'll do it this year. I did it last year. But, you know, no, 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 no. It's a one time. That, that um, special clothing had some bells underneath. It's interesting about those bells. You know why? Because if the priest had not asked forgiveness for every single sin that he has committed, 
when he crossed that curtain, boom, immediately died. Because he was going to come in front of the presence of God. So the people were outside. Oh, there's another piece of information. The priest also wore this rope around his waist. So when he was walking around and doing the things that they did and then praying and some other things, they can hear the little bells, ling, 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 like at Christmas. Ding, 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 ding. And then she got quiet. Or quiet for a little bit. Quiet for a little bit longer, and everybody's like, mm, what's going on? They talk a little bit, the rope, and ding, 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 and start walking around and say, okay, well, fine, still alive. But at one point, the bells start walking, I mean, start sounding, and they tug it, and then nothing happened. They actually took the body out with the rope. Why? Because the Day of Atonement was the cleansing of every single sin that through that year, for the last 12 months, they have been put in there. And if the high priest was not in a perfect condition with God, he was not in a position to be able to minister that cleansing. The other thing that actually happened is around the sanctuary, there were the 12 tribes in a perfect silence. Imagine, millions of people, millions of people around the tabernacle in the middle, in the middle of the desert, in a perfect silence, hearing those bells and praying that God will forgive their sins. Now, having that into context, the Bible says that when, when God gave that to Moses, it was a representation of what is actually happening in heaven, in heaven. So all those things are important to keep in mind. The cleansing of the uh, tabernacle is not just the cleansing of 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 our, uh, the sins of these people now in heaven is the cleansing of our sins, the judgment. So God gave that, gave a huge, a huge um, message to Daniel. And that's where uh, Revelation and, and, um, and, and Daniel gets together. The book of Daniel give us a timeline when the judgment will begin. Let's go to Daniel 8.14. He said to me, for 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the holy place will be properly restored. Some version says, will be clean, cleanse. Will be atoning. That's another word that he uses. So, it says that for 12... 1,200 what? Twelve hundred evenings and mornings. Where do you find the word evening and, and morning? Sorry, yeah, evenings and mornings in the Bible. Creation. It says that God created heavens and earth. It was the first evening, the first morning, the first day. So we're talking about days. So God sent a message to Daniel saying that the, the, the sanctuary was going to be clean, clean within the next 1,200 days. 23, sorry. 2,300 days. I just cut a little bit. 2,300 days. Important. So... Let's talk, about, let's talk about those days. What is important to understand about those days? Now let me see if I can find it here. Hang on a second. Ezra 4.6. And I'm, I'm going to go back and forth into the lesson. But Ezra 4.6 says, When you have complete this, you shall lie down a second time. But on your right side... And bear the iniquity of the house of Judah. Here's the important part regarding this. I have assigned 
assign it to you for 40 days, a day for each year. So when the Bible is talking about in prophecy, when in prophecy the Bible is talking about 2,300 days, what is it actually referring to? According to this text in Ezra. So, we're talking about 2,300 years. According to Ezra. Sorry, Ezekiel 2. Um, uh, not, not Ezra, sorry, that was Ezekiel. Um, so uh, Numbers 14.34 says, According to the number of days which you spied out of the land, 40 days for every day you shall bear your guilt a year, even 40 years. So it's established in prophecy. When we talk about, when we talk about um, prophecy, Number of days is equal number of years. Now, Daniel receives that vision. Daniel 8, 19 to 22 says, And he said, Behold, I am going to let you know that what will occur in the final period of the indignation. Okay, so I'm going to let you know at what, at what period of time? According to Daniel 8, 19, it says, Behold, I am going to let you know what will occur at, at the final period of the indignation. So when is this? At the end of time. Exactly. For it pertains to the appointed time of the end. So this is going to be happening toward the end of times. So the Lord sent this message to Daniel to just to, for him to know about this for the end of times. Uh, then, then Daniel was completely upset. He was not able to sleep. He says that he noticed in, in 827, Daniel 827 says, says, Then I, Daniel, was exhausted for six and sick for days. Then I got up again and carried the kingdom's business. But I was a ton at the vision, and there was no one to explain. So Daniel is like a, what do you mean? That the Lord is not going to come for 2,300 years? I, I don't understand this. Obviously, the first part, and, and we're not going to go through the whole first part of the vision, the first part of the vision, he understood. He was the second part that he didn't understand. The second part is that 2,300 days. Why do you mean this 2,300 days? What? And it says, this is one of my favorite texts in, in Daniel, by the way. Daniel 9, 21 and 22 says, this first part, it says, while I was still speaking in prayer, then the man Gabriel, whom I have seen in vision previously, came to me in extreme weariness about the times and the evening's offering. It's interesting to me that he was just starting praying. He has perhaps not even asked about anything. And God has sent immediately the answer to his prayers. That's the power of prayer. That's what God knows. When you need something, even before you ask for it, he has sent that, even though you don't realize it. You ask for, for protection, it just happened, the protection came up before. You ask about what, this is. Daniel was like, oh Lord, I am so confused. What do you mean? And then and it says, before I started doing this, before I started praying, the Lord has sent Gabriel to explain that to him. The chapter 9 records the angel Gabriel coming to explain the, to Daniel the 2300 days prophecy. Oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you a skill to understand. Whoo! Skill to understand. 
If you think that the prophecies are not easy to understand, if you do not understand the prophecies, if you are blocked about something in the prophecies, ask God and he will send an angel to explain it to you. Or send somebody to explain it to you as well. We have to have faith that these things are important. But the promise is explained that a special blessing, a special blessing will accompany the study of those prophecies. The wise, the wise shall understand. And you're going to study several times, and I had somebody tell me this week, oh, you know how many prophecies, Daniel, uh, Daniel uh, Revelation prophecies seminars I have gone? I just don't get it. Is it that I'm too dumb? Well, I don't know. Have you asked God to teach you that? Have you asked God to give you the understanding that you need to be able to, to, be able to get it? And he said, he will give it to you. Bless is, this is Revelation 1.3, bless is he that read, and they hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written, are written. So in other words, blessed are those that understand this and keep it. Blessed are those that are studying the prophecies and be able to understand it. Blessed are those that don't understand the prophecies. They, they just don't get it. Bless them if they ask God. So let's keep going. So the 2300 days. Let's go Daniel 8, 17, 19, and 26. So he came near, so where I was standing, said Daniel, and when I came, I was frightened and fell on my face. But he said to me, son of man, understand that the vision pertains to the time of the end. Verse 19 says, he said, Behold, I am going to let you know what will occur in the final period on the, on the indignation and pertains to the appointed time of the end. Verse 26 says, Which the vision of the evening and the mornings, which has been told, is true. But keep the vision secret, for it pertains for many days in the future. One of my favorite movies, perhaps it's not a good comparison, one of my favorite movies is Back to the Future. One, two, and three. Love. Seen it more than once. Kind of interesting to know what is going to happen in the future. And is it what humans always try to do? Oh, let's go to a hand reader to tell me what is in my future. Oh, let's, maybe they can read the cards, which I don't understand how you read it, but Let's read the cards. And then they pay tons of money. Let's call somebody over the phone. I don't know. There's one in California, which apparently is over nationwide. And then you just turn around and, and, and you want to know what's going on for me in the future. Well, here it is. You want to know what's going on in the future? It's right here. Daniel, is, God is telling Daniel, this is what's going to be happening at the end of the time. But Daniel didn't get it. Daniel didn't get that. Daniel didn't know what, what he was going to do. He was actually got sick. What do you mean? Then finally, let's go back to Daniel 9. And this is where we're going to spend a little bit of time left, a little bit. Daniel 9, 24 to 27. Somebody can read it with the understanding that I'm going to be stopping you for us in, in here and there. Somebody can read it. Daniel 9, 29 to 27. Anybody? Going once. All right. It says, seven weeks, 70 weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end sin, to make atonement 
for iniquity to bring everlasting righteousness, to seal a vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. Okay, several things are happening. First of all, it says that from those 20, uh, 2,300 days, there are going to be seven, 70 weeks. This is not going to be in the scale, FYI. Okay? There's going to be 70 weeks. Let's put it over here. There are going to be 70 weeks. In those 17 weeks, several things are going to be happening. Well, first of all, it says that 17 weeks are going to be happening for your, for your people. Who are these people? What, what was that? The children, the children of Israel. There are going to be 70 weeks that we're going to have kind of patience, but a lot of things are happening in between. 70 weeks. Is determined for them. And what is the second one? Your people, and what is the second one? And the city. And the city. So this is actually happening to specific individuals, to specific people, and in a specific, for a specific place. Sorry, I, 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 I misspoke. It's going to be happening for a specific people, for a specific place, not in a specific place. Let's keep going. To make, and then what things are going to be happening? So this is going to be happening to finish the transgression, to make end of sin, to make an atonement for iniquity, and to bring everlasting righteousness, to seal a vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. All right. Then it starts with the process. Okay. Now, this is what's going to be happening. Now, when does the, this 2300 days or this these 70 weeks are going to start. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of the decree to restore and to build Jerusalem until Messiah, the prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks and it will be built again with plaza and mode and even in times of distress. So now it's taking the 70 weeks and divided in two other sections. First of all, let's do some math. How many days are 70 weeks? How many days? So we have seven days, seven days a week. 490 days. 490, this is equal. 490 days. And if we apply what Ezekiel says about day per year, how many years are we talking about? 400, 490 years. 490 years. So this period over here is 490 years. Now, there are two... There are two new separations in this 70. Let's go back to, to verse, um, verse 25. It says, So you know that from the discerned, that the issuing the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah, the prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. You know what? Just, just to make it more more space. I'm just going to expand this. Obviously, again, this is not in the scale. It says that from the decree to build Jerusalem until the Messiah. So here is when the decree happened. Until the Messiah are going to be Seven weeks and 62 weeks. How much is that? 69 weeks, right? How many days are we talking about combined? 
uh, 69 weeks. We're short a week, right? Then it says, verse 26, then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing and, and, and have nothing, and the people of the prince will become and destroy the city and the sanctuary. And that will be the end of the floods and all that. So it says that at the end of the 62 weeks, a half of the other week, half a time of that week, the Messiah will be cut. All right, let's go to, to a detail. When was the... Uh, it says, from the decree to build Jerusalem. Let's go back to history before that. What happens is Jerusalem has been destroyed. We had, they had taken everybody out to Babylon, right? And for after Babylon, where did they go? Well, there will be some other kings coming up. Um, Middle Persia and then Greeks and all the stuff that happened in between, right? So finally, Ezekiel said, hey, I am in trouble here. I, I, and Ezekiel wants one of the uh, counselors of, of the king. And it turns around, and Ezekiel was doing his job. And, and, uh, and he's like, well, well, and the king said, hey, what's going on with you? Hey, what's, what, what's happening? And he said, you know what? You know, you know I'm Jew. And, and for so many years, my city, Jerusalem, is being destroyed. And the king said, wait a minute, but didn't some other people has given a decree to rebuild Jerusalem? And, 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 and uh, sorry, that was not Ezekiel, it was Jeremiah. And then Jeremiah said, yeah, but they haven't done it. So two other kings before Artaxerxes, I don't know. Thank you have made a decree to rebuild Jerusalem, but never happened. And that's why this king right now comes in and says, we're going to rebuild it. And then finally, the city of Jerusalem was rebuilt. That's why we have to count this as the initial, this 2300 years, because before it didn't happen. Give me an example. Um, I'll give you, what's your name? Carlana. Carlana. I'll give you $100. I don't like wash dishes. <laughs> I mean, one of the blessings in life for me is the dishwasher. I keep her a whole week and then put her in the dishwasher and done. I'll give you $100 if you wash my dishes. I mean, like a deal. I come later on and I was like, hey, can I, what about if I give you $100 and you wash my dishes? But why am I offering you that? Because she didn't do it, right? And then somebody else comes in and says, hey, I'll give you $100 if you wash my dishes. Well, obviously, it's because neither of these two people did it before. So you ended up doing it. So it, the, the beginning of that time will be when he finished washing my dishes. So from the decree, from the decree of building Jerusalem, when it actually happened, and Jeremiah was the one will start the 2300 years. This is in the year 400. Hang on a second. 456, is it? 57? So this is in year 457. So all that is important. Hang on a second, let me just go back to my notes. So after that, several things will be happening here until we get to this point. And it says that in the middle of that week, the Messiah was going to be killed. In other words, right here in the middle of this week is when Jesus was killed. What year was Jesus born? Thirty-three. 
It was not born in, in the year one. How do we know? Because he was in ministry for 33 years. And it's estimated he died in, in, in the year 27. So he was born before the year one. Now, the other thing is, from the year one, I mean, from 457, the years were not being done like we counted today. The years were not being done like we counted today. Right now, what is going to be next year? What year? We're in 2023, 2024, right? And those days were backwards. Next year was going to be 456 until they got to year one. Now, let's do a little bit of math. Remember that at the end of here, when Jesus cried, when Jesus died, the middle of that week, of those 70 weeks, it says that the, the, um, the sacrifice will cease. Why? Was, was there any need to continue killing one-year-old lambs from this point on? Why not? Because Jesus had already died for us. And one of the signs of those is, remember I told you that in the sanctuary was this huge curtain that was very thick. When Jesus died, the, if, if, you, if we go to the Bible, and, and we can find it, but I'm just kind of running out of time. But it says that the curtain was ripped. But the message is so clear. This says, I, I mean, the, uh, the, the, the evangelist wanted to make very, very clear that the curtain was ripped from top to bottom. I imagine, my thought is, it didn't rip completely. The left a little portion underneath because it shows there was rip from top to bottom. If the whole thing was stripped down, somebody took it. But this one was ripped from top to bottom. In my opinion, leaving a little piece to show there was not a human who caught it. And from that point on, anybody, regardless of their sins, can look inside the most holy place and not get killed. Remember I told you that the, uh, the, the, the high priest had to go with this belt and the rope and they pulled it out and he had any sins? Not anymore. There was no need for that because the actual lamb now has been sacrificed. That's why this morning, before we, walk, we got into church, we don't have a bunch of dead lambs in there asking for forgiveness. Because our God has died. And our sin, where every time we ask for sin, we're taking the holy priest in heaven, Jesus is taking a little bit of that blood, which is his blood, and put it against the most holy place for your sins, for my sins. And now we have to come out with this point that this sanctuary, the sanctuary in heaven, must be clean. A judgment needs to happen. The, the system of, of having no more sin needs to happen. Now, let's get our calculators out. Let's get our calculators out. That's where a little bit of math is also being done. If, if the uh, decree to build Jerusalem happened in the year before Christ, 457, and the prophecy says, that it will last for 2,300 days or years, according to Ezekiel, uh, one day per year. What year is that? Calculator's out. Anybody? Math teachers? Is 
1843. The prophecy says that at the end of this prophecy, the sanctuary will be start being purified or clean. But we have a math problem. 1843, and we've been taught that that actually happened in 1844. Am I correct? Is that math? So what's going on? Then people would look into this and it says, see, the Bible is a bunch of baloney. It's missing a year. Where do you get that year? So tell me where in history it says, in the year zero. Nothing happened in the year zero. They didn't count the year zero. When they got 46, 45, 44, 43, all the way down to one, what are we going to do? Well, let's go up. But they didn't say, okay, well, that next year is going to be zero and the following year is going to be one. Then it started with the year one, up, which lead us exactly to the year 1844. Now, why do we need to learn all this? Is there any reason why we have to have understanding of all this? Turning again to the scriptures, the students of prophecy learned that the cleansing was not a removal of physical impurities, but it was to be accomplished with the blood and therefore must be clean, clean, cleansing from sin. In other words, we have over here, God has started this process of judgment in 1844 to clean the sanctuary for all our sins. While the priest was interceding with God, every heart was to bow in contrition, pleading for the pardon of the transgressions. And this is where we need to be now. Remember I mentioned that the, the day of atonement around the sanctuary, the 12 tribes were around the temple, and it was a perfect silence. Everybody was worried, is my sins going to be forgiven today? This is the time today where we should be in our needs in complete silence in front of God asking for the forgiveness of those sins. When we offer himself, when he offered himself on the cross, Jesus, a perfect atonement was made, was made for the sins of the people. We are now standing in the outer court, waiting and looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ. Prayer and confession are to be offered only to him who he entered once into the most holy place. He will save to the utter all who come to him in faith. Now, is your name has been called yet? Maybe you're done. Maybe God says, oh, yeah, Eduardo Gonzalez, done. It doesn't really matter what he does anymore. Done. No. God has done provision to us that as long as we are alive today, we have a chance to have that forgiveness. The time will end when if you passed away, that will be the last opportunity you had before that to ask for forgiveness. And you do not know if you are going to die today. One of the reasons why we need to study these prophecies and these numbers to make sense is to understand how little time do we have today to ask for those forgiveness. How little time do we have today to be able to receive the 
every day to be able to receive that forgiveness that only Christ can give us. It's only today, this moment that we have, we do not have tomorrow. I'm telling you, we don't even have next minute. The intent to understand in this is that God has a system, a judgment, where everybody is going to be judged. And the, 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 the judging is going to be, does Eduardo Gonzalez give his heart to him, to me? It's not that I pay my tithe, which we should do, but not by salvation. It's not that we came south to church, we, have, we should do it, but that doesn't buy salvation. The real salvation is if I gave my heart to him and asked forgiveness for every single sin that I have. And we have that opportunity right now. We know the future. We know what's happening. Well, we do not know when he's coming. But we know what's happening. We know what is happening right now. We have the, 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 the advantage to know what is happening. Will you take it? The reasons for these studies is to show how much love God has given us and how much he wants us beside him in heaven. That he wants to be sure that we as ask for forgiveness for every single sin. And that's the reason of the prophecy. Confusing sometimes. Message easy. Yes. Excellent point. So, um, and, and for people who are watching us online, what she's saying is that also give us confidence that what he did in the past, I'm going to paraphrase, but what he did in the past, he's also willing to do it for us today. If his prophecies were fulfilled, every promises that he gave us, he will fulfill in us as well. Did, did I paraphrase it correctly? So this is what we're going to do right now. Um, we're going to have a prayer. I'm not big and ask people to stand up, raise their hand. I, I personally don't believe much into that. But I do believe that the Lord calls you in this moment to ask for his forgiveness. Don't waste the opportunity. If the Lord is asking you in this moment, this is what is happening, and you don't know the future, but I want to be with you, don't waste this opportunity. Don't waste it today. Don't waste it later on. Don't waste it before your bed. And, when, and if you wake up tomorrow, don't waste it tomorrow morning. Just do it again. And give yourself to God constantly. Ask forgiveness for your sins constantly so the Lord can actually fulfill his burden. Let's pray. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for these wonderful lessons. Thank you, Lord, that you have given us prophecy that has been fulfilled. So we have full confidence that everything that you have promised us, you're going to do as well. You have promised a, a, a wisdom to understand these prophecies. You have promised that you have a prepared place for us. But overall, Lord, you have promised that if we come to you asking for forgiveness of, of the sins, of our sins, you will forgive them. So, Lord, in this moment, we come to you, Lord, to ask you for forgiveness of our sins. Lord, we are so sinners. I mean, there's not a moment that passed that we have not sinned. But we know that our forgiveness is going to be always in you. Help us to ask you for forgiveness and to stop sinning according, and use the Holy Spirit power to be able to do that. Father, we come to you this morning full of sin, but also so happy that you are forgiven us. Help us, Lord, that when we ask for forgiveness, Satan does not remind us of the sins that we committed. Help us have full confidence that that forgiveness, you've forgotten completely and you have no knowledge of those sins. 
Father, help us that every morning, every day, at every hour, whether we're driving or in school or at work, wherever we are, we can connect with you. And thank you for the wonderful things you have done in our lives. And thank you for the blessing of forgiveness. Thank you, Father, for this Sabbath. In Jesus' name, amen.